Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, let's see. Some people are still coming in, but that's fine. My name is Yuan Yuan Asong, uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about the secret of successful testing in 40 minutes. Sounds doable, right? Um, we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, let's give it a try. So, like I said, my name is Yuan. I come from Sweden, and it's my first time in the Ukraine, so I'm very excited to be here, very happy to have been invited to the conference. I've been in testing since, uh, since 2006, and two years after that, I co-founded my own company, and nowadays I work as an independent consultant, trainer, coach, and sometimes speaker. Uh, and I'm uh, very happy to, to, to be at this conference. It's a, a very nice professional conference. And uh, last night, I hope you, you uh, ma many of you stayed late and, and had good conversations, which, w which is what I think that conferences should be about. We should confer as well as listen to new ideas. And then we go back home, and then we practice, and then we become better at, at this. Um, and so in my work, uh, at least for the past, I don't know, five, six, seven years. It's been a while now. Uh, two of the things that I've interested myself the most in is test strategy and trying to improve testing in different organizations and teams and, and, and uh, with people. And so that is basically the core of what I will be talking about today and how to get that to work. And before we start doing that, maybe it makes sense to talk a bit about what successful testing or good testing even is. So I've made an attempt, and it's a sort of a work in progress, to list some things, list some principles of good testing. And I've, I've sort of taken a cue from the Agile uh, movement and the Agile manifesto. So let's see what you think about this and, and if you agree. And if you disagree, that's great, because that's how we learn. Then you can disagree in, in the Q&A, and, and we can learn something new. That's good. So I would say that we need to favor having an inquisitive mindset over a confirmatory one. So last uh, yesterday, sorry, not last night, uh, yesterday Michael Bolton spoke about confirmatory testing and, and checking and that sort of thing. And we need to do that too. But that's sort of the ground floor. That's, that's verifying what we already suspect. So we need to do that. It's not that that's bad. But in general, what testing is about is learning, finding new information, uh, and, 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 and try to, to uh, communicate that to our stakeholders. And in order to learn, really learn something new, we must be inquisitive, we must be exploring, we must make room for new discoveries all the time. So even if you get a, a, a set of test cases, or even if you get a, a very, uh, very specific instruction to go test something specific, you still need to have that in mind, that you need to learn something. Even when you, you, you read the CI report from last night, what can we learn from this? I think that's very important. Secondly, I think we should favor adaptable planning over rigid plans. So having plans are good, but if they are too rigid or too big, then we run into problem tomorrow because plans will not survive very long at all. Anybody who's been on a project for, for a few months know that what it looks like today is what, not what it looked like six months ago. No way. That never happens. So no plan can survive first contact with reality, and reality keeps on changing. We, we, we run into new contexts daily. And so we should favor having adaptable planning and, and, and having plans that are adaptable. Uh, and strategies as well. Thirdly, I think we should favor deliberate testing over directed testing. And what do I mean by that? Well, oftentimes we're given assignments. Go test this set of requirements, run these test cases. That's fine. We need to do that. It's not do only the bold stuff. It's just favor that over the other thing. Even when you are directed, I would suggest that you as managers need to make sure that you give your testers autonomy and you as testers need to take responsibility to be deliberate in your testing. What am I testing? Why am I testing it? What information can we get from this and how do I convey that to my stakeholders? So be deliberate. Don't just follow an instruction. Because if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's crap testing, if you, if you don't get any new information from your testing, 
I don't want to hear, or you, you should take more pride than to say, well, you told me to do that. That's not good enough. That's, that's not good testing. And it also goes into the next one. I think we need to pay more attention than we're usually doing to the opportunity cost of testing over testing everything. So when we get, when, when, when we get a new user story or we get a requirement to test, we cannot test everything, we know that. Even with automation, we cannot test everything. We cannot check everything. Uh, and so what I suggest that we need to do and become better at as testers, because this is hard to do, every so often, a few times per day, maybe use the 10-minute heuristic, ask yourselves, what am I doing right now? What could I be doing right now? And is the thing I'm doing now more valuable or less valuable than what I could be doing? And if it's less valuable, what you're doing right now, than what you could be doing, then you should probably switch and do the other thing. Because we are a cost. We don't produce software, we produce information. And if we're not doing that in the sort of best way possible at the moment, then we are only incurring a, 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 a cost and not getting the benefit of proper good information. So that is our responsibility as professional testers, to be mindful, what could we be doing instead? And be deliberate, take charge, and do, do the best thing possible. And the benefit, the added benefit to that is then you're able to defend your testing. Then you're able to say, well, I know you told me to do this thing, but I went and did this instead, which is kind of the same, but in a different way, and look at the information I got from that. And you can defend that decision. And even if it turns out you didn't get that information, you can still defend it by explaining how you went there, how, how you made that decision. Then you're being deliberate. We need to use many models over chasing our favorite type of bug. So I see a lot with testers that they, 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 they get stuck in doing sort of their favorite type of testing, like functional testing. It's easy, it's fun. You can see, does this work, does this work? That's fun, but it's not the entirety. It's not the totality of testing. Uh, more technically inclined people might favor security testing, might love performance testing, and that's good, but that's not everything we need to do. We need to look at the product from many different angles, especially if you are a tester on an agile team or if you are the, 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 the only tester, if you, if you don't have a, a test team and, and you have 60 developers uh, as a solo tester, then you really need to uh, to use many models and look at the entire product. And finally, tell your story when you're reporting uh, over relying on vacuous metrics. So if I ask you as a, as a test manager, this is a test management talk, uh, as a test manager to go test something, and you come back to me and said, well, I run, I've run uh, 100 test cases and 90 of them passed and, well, Nine failed, and the, and the final one, I can, I, can, uh, I can do that one, and I found five critical bugs. Uh, I'm done. Um, that's not really giving me very much. It's not very much information in that. That's just data. Uh, I want you to try to explain to me why did you run those tests? What were the risks that you were investigating? What did you try to learn? What did you learn? What do we know now? What do we need to do next, in your opinion? because you are the tester, you are the professional. I'm just a stakeholder. I'm just directing you towards an, a, a goal, and you need to help us get there. So this, I suggest, is, is sort of a foundation. Maybe not the foundation. It could still be improved, of course. But it's, it's, uh, it's my suggestion for today, at least. So now that we know that, or now that we know what I think, at least, uh, then we can talk about a oh, secret to successful testing, a secret to successful testing. So, like I said, I, I focus a lot on strategy and I focus a lot on people because I find those two things to be the most interesting. Not that I don't love technical stuff, I do, uh, but I, I find these two things more challenging. So, for today, we're going to limit the secrets to that. So, secret number one, you need to have a strategy that supports new discoveries. Uh, and not just have one that, that su supports confirming already made suspicions or beliefs. So another way to say that, your strategy needs to do more than just check that, that the requirements are met. Because that is just a tiny, teeny part of, of what you need to do. And the written requirements are just a teeny, tiny part of all the requirements that there actually are. And 
for that strategy to, to, to support new discoveries. What I've suggested in the past, and I've just realized that I need to do blog post on this, I haven't done that yet, but, but in past talks on other conferences, I've, I've suggested that a strategy need to be all these things, or at least in part, all these things. It needs to be concise enough, it needs to be uh, uh, small enough so that you can actually uh, give it to somebody and they can, they can uh, run through it. If you, if you come across a, a test strategy that looks like this, like 50, 100, 150 pages, nobody will read that. So it's useless to start with. And if they could read it, if they wanted to read it, if they really were that masochistic, they would not gain anything from it. Because if, if you can write that many pages uh, about your test strategy, then, then you're for sure using boilerplate. And it's, it's uh, I'm sure I'll find definitions of what a unit test is, and entry criteria, and exit criteria that you, you won't use anyway when it comes down to it. You won't wait for 95% pass rate before you go to the next step of the next test level, whatever that means, which I've seen in IBM test strategies, and for, for instance. Huh? Uh, you need to you, ne you need to be flexible. You need to be justified so that you can that you can actually defend what you're doing. It needs to be explainable. Otherwise, nobody will know what you're doing. Nobody knows what test is doing anyway. But strategy can help you communicate what test what what, what the test team or you as a tester uh, are doing. And I think that's important. The last word there is specific. Be specific, but be specific late. Don't be specific up front, because then you will lose the, the, the flexibility and so on. So as test managers, and I'll come to that in a second, I think we should start high level and then let the, 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 the people who will actually do the, the, the real testing bring on the specifics later. The second part, the second secret, is to surround yourself with passionate, motivated, and skilled people. Simple. Except it's not, of course simple to do that, because where do you find these people? You can't, you can't put out an ad and say, I'm looking for skilled people. Why can't you do that? Well, you can't, but what, what will happen? Well, they're already hired someplace else, because they're skilled and motivated and passionate. So, of course, they're hired. So, you could maybe hire a headhunter and, and go find them. Sometimes that's successful if you have a, a good company culture uh, that can attract these type of people. But more often than not, you need to build these people. You need, to, you need to foster them. You need to create an organization where they can thrive and where they want to sort of develop as testers and become skilled, motivated, and so on. So we, we, uh, you probably heard this uh, expression that we hire for attitude and we train for skill. And that's what I'm talking about, basically. So you, 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 if you can find them, good. If you can't find them, then train, uh, then train them. And, and make sure you have a context around that that supports that. And this is what I will be spending the rest of the talk talking about. So first, strategy. You might recognize this guy, or you might have seen that painting before. That's Miyamoto Musashi. Uh, I realize it's a bit cliche to bring in Japanese uh, analogies to software testing. We, we see that all the time in the Agile movement, for instance. But anyway, uh, I, I've spent a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of years in martial arts. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm allowed one reference. Uh, Musashi was a samurai, I think, in 17th century Japan. And what's really unusual about him is that he died of old age. Not very common in that profession. Uh, and as he was dying in his final sort of months, he was secluded in a cave and he wrote his book, The Book of Five Rings. And it's a book on strategy. And in that, he wrote that immature strategy is the source of grief. His strategy was, of course, the strategy of sword fighting. And I think we can take away two main things from that book as testers, maybe, maybe more, but two things for sure. One thing that he emphasized very much in what he called his school of strategy, the Niten Ichiru, uh, was the mindset of always being intent on cutting. Whatever you do, you must be intent of cutting. Defend, but the intention is to cut. In testing, the intent is on learning, on discovery, like we said in the beginning. And bring that with you into your strategy, and bring that with you into your work at all times. The intention is discovery, the intention is to learn something. Even when you're running automated tests, even when you are scripted, what can I learn? The second thing 
is in his book, he, he writes uh, different lessons or different uh, experience reports, you could almost say, from his life as a sword fighter, as a duelist, as a ronin, as a mercenary. And he realizes at the end of every chapter or paragraph that, well, I, I can tell you all this, but that won't really get you to learn it. So what he says continuously is, you must study this diligently. You must think hard about this. You must practice, practice, practice to attain mastery. And that's also something for us as testers to, to, to keep in mind, that it's not enough to be told what to do. We must also practice. So my view or my model of test strategy looks something like this. And I realize that it's a fairly dense model uh, and we can spend another 40 minutes talking only about this. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll run through it now and then we can meet up in the hallways throughout the day and, and we can chat more about this model in particular. But what I suggest, like I said, I suggest a multi-level strategy, first of all. Not just a, a, a high-level document uh, that gets us nowhere, but we as test managers, I think we should set the stage. We should, we should have a strategy that answers three questions. What are we testing? Why are we testing it? And how should we test it? And as test managers, we start with what? And so that's what I call the product model. That's all the requirements, and that's not working. All the requirements, uh, all the claims that you hear about the product, all the information from the product manager, uh, everything, all the information you can sort of get your hands on surrounding the product, connected to the product. That's your product model. That's what you're testing. Requirements is an obvious source, of course. Then the next level would be the information goal or the information goals. That's also the domain of the test manager, if such exists in your uh, company. If you're the only tester or, or your teams are completely autonomous in how to, how to secure quality, uh, then, then, uh, then this is your domain as well. What I mean by information goal is what, why, sorry, why. Why are we testing? What information are we after? What questions do we want to answer with our testing? So it could be, for instance, the obvious thing, go find important bugs. But that's, that's just part of, of what we can do with testing. So for instance, we might also need to uh, investigate uh, compatibility with uh, other OSs, compatibility with certain printers or other programs in the system. Uh, we might be up for certification for, for a specific standard or something like that, or we might have a, a, an audit coming in, so we need to prepare for that and testing will help with that. We might be in a situation where we want to figure out what the product can do instead of what it can't do. What it can't do is sometimes pretty simple, especially early on. We know it can't do very much at all. But there is a customer demo in two weeks. We need to figure out what it can do. I think John Bach calls it uh, sympathetic testing. What can the product do instead of what can it do? That's also testing. That's also an information goal. And that will change how we approach the testing. That will change the strategy. And so the, the, the third level, moving to the right, uh, would be with the information goal in mind, trying to come up with risks and impediments and tasks that we need to perform, questions we might have about this information goal, assumptions that we need to make in order to test. I think it's fine to make assumptions. And I think we should make them explicit. The only time it's, it's, it's not good or, or wrong, uh, the only time it's wrong to make an assumption is if you don't tell anybody about it. Because then, then you might get into trouble. But it's okay to make them if, if you make them explicit, if your stakeholder knows about them. And then the stakeholder, test manager, whatever, can help you get rid of them and not make them assumptions anymore, but make them facts and give you the information that you need. Uh, and you might have other needs uh, on uh, test equipment, test data, and so on. I think that's all part of the strategy at this point. And this is where I suggest that you hand over to your testers or test team if you're a manager, because they probably know this stuff a lot better than you do. Don't try to get too much into the details. Give them the what and the why and let the professionals, uh, even though you might be one yourself, but let the people who are actually testing take care of the, the how. And like I said, I don't favor documents. I favor sticky notes. I favor whiteboards. I favor mind maps. Anything that makes it easier to communicate uh, and, and that makes it more visible 
than to put it in a document. I'm not saying don't put it in a document. I've worked for the past, I don't know, five, six years in organizations that really needs the documents for, for, for uh, traceability later and for certification. I've worked in med tech, I've worked in the automotive industry. We need documents, but that's more for posterity than for actually uh, getting to a, a, an actionable test strategy. So then you have to do both, and that's why they pay you as a manager, I guess. And then finally, uh, when you have that, which isn't an easy thing, thing to do, of course, but when you have some risks, and as we move to the right in this model, things multiply, even though it doesn't show very well in, in this model right now. So if you have one information goal, you will have 10 risks, you will have 100 test ideas, and so on. How will I actually test this? A rough idea of how. And then as late as possible, you try to decide, okay, now I have some ideas about how to test this. Do I want to automate? Do I want to run some role-based testing? Do I want to do charters and do session-based uh, session testing, session-based exploration? Uh, do I want to bring in some customer for some customer testing? Or, or, or what should we do to actually uh, test this thing? And then you tie that all the way back to the information goal, the why. And that's how you frame your testing in the end. So, I realize this is, is quite a lot, and, and that's what the rest of the talk is about, how to actually get there with the team. Uh, I will also plug Michael Bolton and James Box's uh, heuristic test strategy model, which is the tool that I primarily use to go from the information goal to the risks. So this, I think, is a great tool. It's available online, uh, and uh, there is a big community of testers on, for instance, Twitter and so on, and, and a lot of blog posts that can help you use this tool efficiently. So, that's strategy. Now people. Because if you're confused now, then I'm not surprised, uh, because I've spent about five minutes trying to explain an idea to you, and now go do it. No, that's not how it works. Uh, People are complex, and that's why I like working with people and focus on people. Uh, Jerry Weinberg, who was mentioned yesterday, uh, said famously that no matter how it looks at first, it's always a people problem. Even though it may appear as a technical problem or a situational problem, then there is always somebody reacting to that situation, and that becomes the problem. So it's always a people problem. And that's what I like about this field, that you get to play around with tech, and you get to do it with people. So, a few things about people and about challenges working with people. Uh, number one, be aware of your biases. Some biases were mentioned yesterday. Uh, I think it was the endowment effect. In Sweden, we call it the IKEA effect, because we're Swedish. I see you have an IKEA outside. It's excellent. I feel right at home. Your flag is yellow and blue, minus two. It's awesome. Um, Dan Ariely, who, um, who, uh, who has studied this a lot, who has studied behavioral economics. He's the, he's the head of Duke University's Center for Advanced Hindsight. How cool is that? That's an awesome name. Uh, he studies biases, and he studies how we sometimes, or a lot of times, make irrational decisions. And uh, he, he says that we're all susceptible to a formidable array of decision biases. And there are more of them than we realize, and they come to visit us more often than we'd like to admit. And that's a problem if you don't know about it. But if you know about it, you can, you can sort of be on your guard. I used to be very susceptible to the confirmation bias. I used to only accept information that supported beliefs that I already held. And that, of course, is bad, because then you won't change your mind, even though you're presented with, with good evidence. And I know that about myself, so I don't have that problem anymore. I, 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 can, I, can, I can now take in data, and I can realize, well, this goes against what I believe. Maybe I should study this because a chance to change my mind, that's great. And so you can, you can work with biases, and learn more about biases and expect them and see them in other people. As managers, that's very useful if you're in a meeting with, with, uh, with different, uh, different categories of people. You can recognize when a decision is being made with a bias, uh, with a bias uh, at the bottom. Uh, and, and, and try to counteract that and try to point out, well, are you sure about this? Because now it sounds like you're uh, running the risk of uh, confirmation bias and so on. A second problem or challenge, maybe we should say, 
uh, with people is embracing your inner elephant. So we used to talk about the left brain and the right brain. We don't really do that anymore. Uh, but Daniel Kahneman, for instance, wrote about the system one and system two thinking and thinking fast and slow. Uh, Jonathan Haidt calls it the rider and the elephant, the two parts of our mind, where the, the rider is unfortunately the weaker part. Uh, it's, the, it's the logical part of us, the analytical part, that requires direction and wants to have clear instructions and wants to go that way. But then we have the elephant, the much bigger player in, in our brain, who requires motivation. Well, I know where you want me to go, but why should I? I'm going to go there. This looks fun, shiny. And that's a problem. Uh, and as managers, we need to be uh, we need to be cognizant of, uh, of, of this. We need to be aware uh, that this can happen. This is a heuristic, by the way. It's not, it's not an absolute truth, but it's, it's, uh, it's I think, a, a, an interesting psychological phenomenon that we can work with. And Heights and also the Heath brothers, Dan and Chip, pro uh, propose a framework uh, that I've tried using uh, where you, uh, you look at three aspects. You, when you try to get people or a team to move somewhere, you first ask, your, ask yourself, uh, is, is, a, is, is this a rider problem? Aren't people moving because they don't know where to move? So for instance, with the test strategy, what, what, what am I expecting actually? What is the sort of clear uh, instruction that I may not have given the team that makes them unable to move right now? They wanna move, but they can't move. Maybe I need to direct the rider and be precise, show them the goal, script the critical elements of that move. What's step one, what's step two, what's step three? Maybe that's clear, but maybe they don't want to move. Okay, so we want to explain, we, we, then we need to motivate the elephant. How do we get them to move? Why should you move? What's in it for you? Uh, how might this make your day better? Uh, and and we, can, we can help by also uh, shrinking the thing that we're asking them to do instead of giving them that whole test strategy model and said, say, good luck. Uh, we, can, we can say, okay, so let's talk about information goals. Uh, let's do that for this sprint and so on. Uh, and, and, and help the elephant that way. And thirdly, we can shape the path. And agile people will recognize this as removing impediments and so on. Shape the context around the team, around the testers, to help them move. They might be willing, they might know where to go, but there might be things in the way that is making it harder for them. Maybe not impossible, but harder. So get that out of the way. And as managers, one way uh, I like to think about this is, is Dan Pink's old model about autonomy, mastery, and purpose, is one way to both shape the path and to, to sort of motivate the inner elephant. Uh, give your team enough autonomy so that they can do deliberate testing. Don't try to direct them too strongly. Give them a sense of responsibility and they will take that if all the other pieces are in place. If the other pieces aren't in place, they will freeze up. Too much responsibility. But give them enough autonomy and support them in their quest for mastery to be the Miyamoto Musashis, to always study and become better and try to instill in the culture a sense of purpose, that we are part of something greater, even though we're just testers. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> even though we don't produce anything, we're still part of the whole that makes it possible for stakeholders to make business decisions, and it's possible for developers and product owners to know where we're at. We're the headlights. We shine a light on problems and on good things, and that's something to be proud of. Finally, it's important to understand habits when we try to introduce a change. So if I, if I come to your test team and I say, I have a great idea for how to work with test strategy, and all you need to do is adopt this, and never mind what you're doing right now, just change. Mm, it's not gonna work. Uh, it's not that people in general maybe fear change that much. Uh, some people do, but it's, it might be too much, and if it's imposed on people, then for sure it's not gonna work. So we need to be mindful that people are working in a, in, a, in a certain way today. They have habits, they have needs, and people generally like security. They, li they like routine to some extent. I mean, some people favor, favor having something new every day, but generally with people, I've found that uh, we like to be uh, somewhat uh, aware or, or, or be able to prepare ourselves for what's, what, what's to come 
next day. We don't like too many surprises, not all the time, not every day. We like to know our sort of place uh, in life. So we need to be mindful of people's habits. And the way habits work, uh, according to Charles Duhigg, is that habits is a way for the brain to save effort, basically. So by, by creating routines, the brain can do that. And we have cravings that reinforce these routines and make them into habits, basically. So one example, which I, 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 it might be kind of grim, but uh, the habit of an alcoholic, for instance, is what's depicted here. Uh, you have a cue, and in the case of an alcoholic, you might get home from work, you might be uh, stressed, you might crave relief, and so you get relief. Maybe not in the best way, but you get relief through the routine of that bottle and then you get the reward. Now what AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, do to, to sort of break this habit, this bad habit, is they supplement the routine. And they try to find a routine that produces a similar reward. And so their proposal is AA meetings, or talk to your sponsor, and break down your sort of relief issues that way and get a similar reward after some time. And that is the basic theory, to insert something new that produces the same type of reward. So if we want to help a team to adopt a new idea of test strategy, we need to figure out, okay, what do, what do people value today and how might we get them to adopt this as a routine without disturbing too much and also produce a similar sort of reward? Do they, do they value safety? Is that what they value or are they actually uh, hungry for new ideas? Well, that's, that makes it easier then. Then we don't need to break habit, we just need to, to, to sort of instill a new one. But I think it's important to be mindful about how people operate with habits and, and, and uh, make sure to, to uh, not run straight through them because that will not work, that will not break bad habits. So in the final minutes, I'll give an example. Um, of what I'm working with now, and an idea that I've, I've, uh, I'm, I'm kicking around after being, uh, uh, being given this sort of idea by, by an old colleague, uh, Martin. Uh, he said to me uh, uh, about a half a year ago, let's get everybody to talk about test impact, and let's do test impact analysis. And I thought, well, okay, why not? But the more I think about it, that's, that's actually kind of great. For, for, a, for, a, for a number of reasons. So what I mean by test impact, I don't mean just the code. Uh, there are many tools out there today that will help you uh, select the correct set of unit tests to run based on which models, modules in the code have changed. And that's test impact analysis. That's fine, that's good. But I, I'm talking about something bigger and I'm talking about getting people to talk about that, not just running uh, a tool that will tell you which unit tests to, to run. Uh, again, I'm borrowing from the heuristic test strategy model in the, in the box there. Uh, I would suggest uh, uh, asking the team to talk about different aspects, different project aspects and quality aspects, and try to get them to figure out, okay, so the change that we are implementing right now, how will that impact our customers? How will that impact information uh, in the project? How will that impact reliability or any other quality aspect that might be extra valuable to our product? and our project at this time in the project, because that might change. And then think, okay, so what do we need to do? What, what, what kind of tests do we need to run in order for, that, uh, for, the, for the change to, to not affect the system negatively? That sort of test impact. It's important to start then with a clear basic concept and not to overwhelm the team, like, like I've said. Um, and that's about motivating the elephant as well as directing the writer, a clear concept, a clear direction. Where do we want to go? I want to go here. I want to talk about this box right here and the contents of this box. Uh, and only this, not everything, not the entire model, that comes later. But start here and talk about test impact only. We want to explain to the team how this will help them, another way to motivate the elephant. Uh, how will this actually make it easier for the team to work down the line uh, and, and, and get them moving that way. So it's not just extra work, it's something that will actually be useful. So, small routines also, uh, also prevents 
the team and the organization from plunging into chaos. Uh, some of you have probably seen uh, change management theories and diagrams like the Satira change model where you implement a change or you impose a change and immediately the team or the organization plunges into productivity chaos and nothing comes out for, for a good while. Try to counteract that by, by doing things small. So instead of giving you the entire model like I did in five minutes, uh, I start with just a test impact when I try to implement this. Another tactic is to sandwich new routines in between familiar ones that the team is already uh, already engaging in. So for instance, in a sprint planning session or something like that, when we try to uh, divide up the work that we're going to do for, for the next couple of uh, weeks, we are doing analysis already. Sometimes we're doing estimation, although that might not be as useful as people think, but we try to analyze the work we're, we're about to do. Then we can do this as well. Then I, I, I ask the team nicely, could you please look at, at, at the context of this box and, and, and try to think about the impact this change will have and come back to me and let's talk about that. That's step one. And the thing I like the most, I think, about the idea of test impact is it's, it's easy to talk about because it's a, it's, a very, it's a very big subject, but even if you just light the spark to get people to start talking about this, it will, it could eventually uh, become what's, what's called a keystone habit, which is a small change that acts as sort of a lever and over time changes everything. So if we start talking in this way, if we start uh, thinking in this way about these things, then eventually we can, we can bring up the concept of information goals. We can start talk about the next level in, in, uh, in test strategy. So how do we get to the information goals? We can talk about test ideas, how to structure them, how to come up with them, how to attack them with different set of test techniques and so on and, and, and get people moving away maybe from, from a confirmatory mindset into an inquisitive mindset. And over time, even though we might not be dealing with, with even test professionals to start with, uh, we might be able to develop a team that is able to handle uh, the full scope of what I think test strategy needs to be. So, we're almost out of time. So, as a summary, we've covered quite a lot and we're still only on, on, on sort of part of, of the secret uh, of, of successful testing, of course. Principles of good testing, uh, please help me develop those feedback on those uh, through any means you, you'd like, online or otherwise. I would propose a multi-level test strategy. I would propose that we have clear, explicit responsibilities so that everybody knows what to do. Uh, one thing that I come across quite often is that we have a, a, a somebody in a management position say that we should do things roughly like this. And then we have people doing roughly testing, but then we have nothing in between. So it becomes just checking and it becomes just confirming requirements. And it fits with the strategy because you can drive a truck through that strategy. Because the truck, uh, sorry, the strategy basically just say where to store your test cases, what the entry criteria and all that stuff is. And that's useless, it's no value. Be explicit and, and, uh, and think about the things in the middle. Oh, sorry. Know your biases, direct the rider, motivate the elephant, shape the path. Autonomy mastery and purpose will give your team motivation and individuals motivation and make them into those passionate and later on skilled people that you were after that you couldn't find because they were hired by your competitor. And finally, keystone habits, small changes that changes everything. Sandwich them in, make them small, be mindful about what the team is doing, the routines they are already uh, employing and, 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 and uh, try to get them in piece by piece. These aren't books on test management, but these are books on test management. Thinking Fast and Slow was mentioned yesterday, uh, and I think this is a, a valuable addition to any bookshelf, test managers or testers for that matter, to, to understand part of the psychology of, of, of people and how we work, and testing, I think, is, is is a field that, that uh, employs a lot of psychology and a lot of people wear uh, to, to, to get to work successfully. And I'll make these slides available, uh, don't worry. Um, and 
since I did run through everything quite quickly, uh, I will apologize by offering a lifetime support on this material. Uh, you can find me online in various channels, and I'll be, of course, here all day roaming the hallways, uh, which is what a conference is all about, finding people and talk to people, uh, especially speakers. Don't be afraid of speakers, even those who speak funny languages. Okay, uh, I'll open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you for your speech. And I have a question. How do you motivate yourself? I'm sorry? How do you motivate yourself? How I motivate myself? Yeah. Well, kind of in the same way, but what motivates me is, is learning. Uh, I'm constantly trying to learn new things. And one of the ways I learn new things is by doing this. Uh, when I'm invited to come to a conference or when I send in a proposal to a conference, I usually propose something that I don't know everything about. And in the process of actually creating the talk, I learn a lot. And even though I know a lot about this already, I learn new things as I try to figure out what to say to you guys. So how do I explain this? Because I, I have it in here somewhere, but how do I verbalize it? How do I verbalize it in a second language? Um, and, and, and that, that is a motivation in itself, because I know I will learn a lot. And, and uh, by learning, I can sort of be better at my job, I can help people more easily. Uh, and that's something that is a driving force for me. So, so what I would say to your question is to, to, to find what, what motivates you generally and try to incorporate, incorporate that in your work. So I've sort of directed my career towards the, 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 the Dubin side of, of development. Uh, and I try to learn as much as possible about that, uh, and that kind of gets me going. Yeah. Hello. Um, uh, can you say what problems does uh, your experience create in your testing process? Uh, what was the last bit? Create in the in your testing process. Uh, what problems um, does your experience create in your testing process? In my process? Yes. So, so if, if, I, if I implement this, what, what problems are created? Exactly. By? I'm sorry? Exactly. Yeah, OK. Um, what problems are created by doing this? Well, I think the, the, the implementation is a problem in itself. And, and sometimes. I was, I was at a talk yesterday uh, about security testing, uh, where a, a great point was made by, by Mikhail there. Um, sometimes you run into opposition when you try to implement a change, because if you show somebody this entire model, uh, management will realize, well, it, it will take a lot of time to, uh, to implement this. And it's a lot of work to do all this. You want, you want teams to spend time on creating a strategy like that, that will take forever. We need to code. We need to get something out the door. We're already late. So you run into that sort of problem, that you, that you not only need to motivate teams to try to adopt your idea, but you also need to uh, motivate management to let you do this idea. And the, and the thing I got from the talk yesterday that I mentioned uh, was that don't, don't let, don't let uh, things like a lack of money or a lack of time uh, stop you. There is always time uh, in the day. You have some downtime. You maybe even have uh, you maybe even have time given to you by your employer to to do things like 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 uh, better yourself and 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 study different subjects. Some some people get uh, three hours a, a month or maybe a day every other week or something like that for the team to uh, to study new things. Use that time. Don't ask for permission necessarily, but find those hours or, or, or minutes or coffee breaks. We have a lot of coffee breaks in Sweden. We love our coffee. Uh, where you can actually talk about this or invite people to, to a brown bag lunch and introduce these concepts. So management resistance is sometimes a problem. Work around it. Find the time. Instill the passion in people. That's, that's one answer. I'm not sure if that was what we were going for, but feel free to ask again. <laughs> yes.
Hi, thank you for your speech. My thank name you. is Igor Samokish. I work as a technical test analyst in Visma Labs Could Latvia. Could you lift up your mic, please? Yeah, Visma Labs Latvia and also as a test consultant. And I have a question about um, implementation of this approach. How would you explain to your stakeholders that this stuff are needed and, well, how you overall uh, explain that mm. you need these things? Yeah. Uh, it is difficult, but I, I, I kind of like Michael Bolton's analogy of testing and checking, although I, I usually say exploration and checking. So what I, what I run into a lot with, uh, with management, dev management, line management, is uh, a lack of understanding about testing, basically. And uh, there is a famous Swede called Richard Edgren, he's famous in Sweden. He doesn't have a very big online presence, but there is uh, the Little Black Book on Test Design is available uh, for free online. Little Black Book on Test Design. Uh, and there is also a book on strategy that he wrote. Uh, and he is famous in Sweden for the testing potato, which is a, it's a diagram that outlines everything you can test, the, sort of the universe. And there is also uh, the part where you have the rec written requirements, which is just a, a small part of this universe. And then the potato is him outlining what we will test. And that is what I'm trying to get to uh, get management to understand in those situations, that testing is not just looking at that little white piece of paper in this, in this image. You have the universe and you have this small box with requirements. You need a potato that covers a lot more of the universe, and the only way to get there is through exploration. So even though you think that we're doing, as a manager, good testing by just checking the requirements and say, this, these are greens, all the unit tests are green, uh, we have the acceptance criteria green, we're done. No, we're not done. Because you, you can go into your bug management system and pick out any number of bugs and show this wasn't found by a test case, this wasn't shown by, found by a test case. We found this by looking in different places. We found this by, uh, through serendipity, or we found it through, through exploration of risks that weren't connected to any known written requirement or any known test case. It happens all the time. Uh, and in that way, I try to get management to understand that we need to do more than checking. And in order to do more than checking, we need to be, uh, we need to be deliberate and we need to be structured. Because I can send testers out, uh, I can send 100 testers out and say, explore the product. But when they get back, they will only give me bugs, and I have no idea who tested what, or in what part of the product, or with which quality criteria in mind. I don't know how they did it, so I know nothing about the coverage. I know only that I sent 100 testers out and I got bugs back. So we need a structure for that, and that's the test strategy. So we, we, we need to be structured uh, with exploration as well. Exploration is not ad hoc in, in, the, in, the, in the colloquial sense. It's not just testing, happy testing, do whatever. We need to be structured with our exploration as well. We need to be able to talk about what we explored and why and how we made different decisions through exploration. Um, usually when I have that little talk with managers, they at least listen because this is new to, to, to a lot of them. And then if, if they light up, then we can have a longer conversation. If they don't light up, ignore them and do it anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, time is out. So, if any questions, you could ask. Yeah. I'm around. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice rest of the conference.